Hey, and welcome to Journey Church Eva. Our mission here at Journey is to help you discover your real life purpose in Christ so you can make a difference in your world. We would love to hear from you. Check out the show notes for a link to send us an email and a link if you want to give. There's also a link for prayer requests. We have a prayer team that will touch God on your behalf. So send us those prayer requests and let's all watch God move in your life together. You will also find the like, comment, and the subscribe buttons below. Go ahead, hit all three of them. But most importantly, we want you to hit the share button and let's send this message to those of your friends and family that may need some encouragement today. Now, here's today's message. We hope it blesses you, challenges you, and helps you grow stronger in your walk with Jesus. How are you this morning, Journey Church? Amen. We are blessed and we are highly favored to the Lord. Say amen to that. Amen. Amen. And again, I'm very excited about this new uh, Life 180 group we've got. We've got uh, just a thrive there going on right now. And as you can tell, that's going to be a fun group to be with. Amen. So if you're in the age, again, up to 25 years old, you want to be a part of that, that's going to be awesome. A lot of those are going to be serving at the uh, golf tournament. Yes. Yes, a lot of those will be the golf tournament, and we got that serving. And really want to push if you get, get those last sponsors in, we're, we're winding the sponsorship up for that. So again, get those in this next week, and we're going forward. And again, that, let me just tell you what that does. It funds our Heart of Christmas outreach 100%. This is the only thing we do to fund that, and it funds it every year because you guys get out there and you get those sponsors and people give. And again, we're just blown away at God's giving. Say so thank you, Lord. Amen. All right. Let's pray before we go any further. Father, thank you for the word that's coming before we ever get. If you want the word, say amen. Amen. All right, Lord, they want it. Here it comes. Bless it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now turn to your neighbor and say, you asked for this. Now, last week I did a message called developmental faith, how your faith is constantly being developed by something or someone. How many know between last week and this week, your faith has been developed some more? It's been good or bad. I don't know. I hope it's been good, and it's supposed to be good in Christ, but even the bad can turn around for the glory of God. Can I have an amen there? Now, this week, and I told some of you last week, I'm going to be speaking on what I call developmental marriage. And remember, you asked for this. You said you wanted the word. Now, let me give a precursor before I finish this message or before I even start it. Some of you, we got a lot of people. Well, Raise your hand if you're married. Leave it up if you're happily married. Oh, (laughs) all right. Raise your hand if you're single. Raise your hand if one day you kind of maybe want to be married. Some of those hands went down too. (laughs) And you may think, man, I picked a bad Sunday to come. I'm single. Nothing for me here. Let me tell you something. You especially ought to be paying attention to what I'm going to preach today. Because if you ever think of you want to get married one day, you need to understand what I'm going to say. Where you don't make a mistake. Amen. Can I have a better amen? Amen. Because just like everything else, just like our faith, our marriage is constantly being developed by something or someone. Constantly. Marriages don't stand still. They either get better or they get worse. They don't stand still. Can a married people, can I have a kind of a, uh? So the question we have to ask in our first note today is, what is developing your marriage? Now, again, you raised your hand, said, I'm married. Some of you said, I'm even happily married. What's developing your marriage? What has developed it to where it's at? What's developing it right now? And what does the future look like for your marriage? Now, I'm going to take a look at some scriptures today that you'll think, man, ain't nothing to do with marriage, but I want to take them from a marriage perspective. And I'm not going into this and that and the other about marriage and Ephesians and the different places I go sometimes, because I want to give you two from a little bit different angle. Now, again... Everybody's either married or going to be married, maybe one day. Not too many people live their life single for their whole life. Now, you may be divorced, you may be widowed and stuff, but again, you're still developing. Everybody say develop. Now, I want to start at the beginning. Everybody say the beginning. Now, we have in the Bible, in the book of Matthew, we have what we call the, the Great Commission. Go, therefore, into all the world, Right? You know, we call it kind of the great suggestion to most Christians. They don't really take it as a full-fledged commission. It's more of a suggestion, but it's not a suggestion. It is a commission. You are commanded to do that. 
Now, but what I want to do with marriage is go all the way back to what I call, everybody say, the original commission. This is the original commission for all of mankind to ever come to the earth. Amen? And it's found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28. It is the original reason God put us here, male and female. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's start from the beginning. And that this is a pattern for marriage and family. Right out of the gate, he established what it's about, what it's for, and how it should be developed. Somebody say, okay, here we go. Now watch this. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says this. Then God said, who said? God said the government didn't. Can I get a better witness there? We're talking God, not government. Government had nothing to do with this and should stay out of it. Has nothing to do with it. Then God said, let us make man in our image, which means the whole trinity of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, was there at the beginning. For a lot of people, they think, well, Jesus just was invented or created when he came into the earth. No, he's here now. In the beginning, let us, the us is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our, in God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit's image. So look to somebody and say, I'm in the image of God. I'm of the image of his Son. And I'm in the image of the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says so. Woo! Y'all look good this morning. Hallelujah. Now watch this. Let them, not let just him, but let them, let them have, everybody say dominion. dominion. Now I can stop and preach this just from what I call the kingdom message, but I got to preach this from the marriage message, so I'm not going to stop on these words. Let them, this couple, this man and woman, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. In other words, they were even going to have authority over the enemy because the enemy's creeping and prowling around. And if the commission was for them back then, it's still for you and me today. You've got authority over that little creepy thing. Yeah. Hallelujah. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Now watch this. Next verse. So God, not government. So God and not the government created man in his own image. In the image of God, not government. Let me say that again. In the image of God, not government, he, God Almighty, created for himself male, say it with me, and female. That is the only thing available in the planet Earth. There's only two genders, male, female. Two different chromosomes. That's all there is, all there ever will be in the name of Jesus. And I don't care what you say, I don't care what I think personally, which I believe the Word of God personally, I don't care what the government says. I don't care what a judge says. I believe what thus saith the Word of God. He created him, male and female, he created them. That's all there is to it, guys. You may not like it, but it doesn't change the facts. Next verse. Then... God, not government, blessed them. God blessed them, and God, not the government, told them to do this. Now, here's the plan for marriage, and here's the first marriage. You put them together. Now, here we have it. Be fruitful and multiply, which I think we all understand that. Okay? Have some young'uns. Okay? Fill the earth and subdue it. <laughs> Some of y'all ain't getting that. The original commission was for male and female, man and woman, to be joined as husband, wife. Be fruitful together, which means be fruitful of the things of God. Get together, consecrate the marriage, spit out a few kids, raise them up in the glory of God, let them marry, put out. Take this to the whole earth. That's the original commission, was to have a place, an earth, filled with the glory of God and his marriage and his families. But we messed that up pretty doggone bad. But we can get it back. Now, let, again, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Somebody say, that is the word of God. And that's the word of God for marriage. He created male and female to become one 
to be fruitful in the things of God and to multiply this into the children. And then those children raise up. They, they are fruitful in the things of the Lord. They multiply and they pour that into their kids. And that was the original commission. And to subdue and have dominion over the whole earth. Dominion means you have the king's reign. You have his authority. But we've surrendered our authority to Satan and he, we've let him tell us what a marriage should and shouldn't be. Okay? Now, here's the thing about it. If you are not developed in your thinking about what marriage is going into marriage and you wasn't developed in the Word of God, then you were developed wrong. Amen. Now, it's, it's going to, you've got to have some big boy britches on here. And we don't like to admit we're wrong about anything in America. We are very prideful. But the Bible says pride goeth before destruction. Okay? So get away from the pride. Don't get your little feelings hurt, because they can get hurt in here this morning, especially where I'm going to go here in a little bit, because I'm going to talk about some people in here today. Everybody say, well, <laughs> that's good, David. So if you, do, if you weren't developed on the Word of God about marriage, listen to me now, you were developed wrong. Doesn't mean you're, you're a bad person. Doesn't mean you're, you're, you're going to hell. It just means that you were developed wrong. You were developed into something that it wasn't. From somewhere, somebody put something that didn't line up with God's Word in your life, and if you run with that, you're never going to have what God wants you to have fully in life or marriage. Now we're talking about marriage today, amen? Now, I brought something up in a message about a year, maybe two ago, and I want to bring it up again today, because it changed a lot of people's views. They're like, wow, I did not know that. And so we're going to take just a little sideline. In, in the original Hebrew marriages, everybody say Hebrew. In the Hebrew, which is what the Old Testament's written in, Old Testament's Hebrew, New Testament's Greek, okay? But in the Hebrew times, in the Israeli times, in the Hebrews, when you got married, the wife literally in those times became a possession of that man. Now, a few of the older women just went, amen. Younger women going like, I ain't nobody's possession. <laughs> Tell you that right now. See, you've been developed wrong. You've done women live yourself right out the Bible. They became a possession. But listen to me now. When you get married, ladies, you become the possession of your husband, and your husband comes the possession of you. Amen. Nothing wrong with that. That's Bible. Amen. Turn to your neighbors. That's a good thing. It's good. It's good, and. But when that happened, the wife would drop her last name and take on the husband's last name and we still have that tradition in america today amen but see what happened and I don't, i've researched some more on this but i can't find when it began to happen and it mainly only happens in europe and america the rest of the nations of the world don't ever hardly participate in this that we can find and that is we come into a modern society where oh i am still me as an individual not when you get married not when you get married you're not the two have become one. Yeah. And so what we have now is we have a lot of ladies who want to leave their last name and move it to the secondary name, signifying I have not truly given myself to my spouse. I'm still hanging on to my word in my family. And they do it. How many people do you know right now, if you go and look at their titles, it'll be little Susie and what Johnson and then, then she married a Smith. She's not Susie Johnson Smith anymore. She's Susie Ann Smith now. Oh, I know it ain't going to be popular. I know it's not popular. But now here's the thing about it. If some women like, and I've had a bunch of men, oh, that really helped me. I released. I feel a release when I've done that. And da, 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 da. Now listen to me now. It's not disrespecting the family you came from. It's not about a disrespect of, of your mom or your dad ladies. It is an honor and respect to what God has given you and you've given yourself to. Now, listen to me now. And I had a few that came to me and said, well, I, you know, I know I need to do it, but I really... Don't do it then. If you do it without the willingness of the heart and the understanding, it ain't gonna still, it's still going to be bad for you because you're still going to have the mindset. Right. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19 says this about our life. If you are willing and obedient, then you will eat the good of the land. It's not just when you become obedient without a willing heart that you have the best of the land. It's when you're willing and you understand and you want to do it because it's Bible and it's love. And you're not casting your family aside. Can I give you another tradition in America we've come up with that's, not, that's absolutely not biblical? 
You might as well say, yeah, because you're going to get it. Thank you all. You're at the wedding day. The new young couple, they get married. They, I now pronounce you husband and wife. They trolley off to the celebration time and people would come up and the dad may come up to the son-in-law or to the daughter-in-law and the mom will come up to the son-in-law or daughter-in-law and they'll say, welcome to the family. That's absolutely not scriptural. But that's the mindset we have in the American way now. I'm marrying into your family. No, you're not. It, boy, it got real quiet in here. It's not welcome to my family. It's let's celebrate there's a new family. There's a brand new family got created that day and they have left their father and mother and they are cleaving to one another and it is something brand new in the earth that God just did. Now, yes, they're an extension of us. I'll never not be a dad to any of my daughters. But when they get married, they have a family now outside of my authority. But I still can bless them. And I choose to do that by letting them be a family and relinquishing my role. Hard? Yes. Yes. Biblical? Yes. So it ain't welcome to the family. It's the new family you celebrate that day. Amen? I know some of y'all don't like this already. But we done locked the door so you can't get out. Now, here's my most fun saying about marriage I adopted about two years ago. Go ahead and put it on the screen. You know it's coming. Marriage works. Come on, let's just read this together. One, two, three, read. Marriage works 100% of the time when you do it God's way. Guarantee you. For sure. I got a Cajun friend. For sure. 100% of the time. What's the failure rate when you do marriage God's way? Zero. There is no failure rate when you do it God's way. It works 100% of the time. So what does that tell us? Anytime your marriage ain't working out and things ain't going right, that means something is not 100% right with God's Word. And I'm sure it's your spouse's fault. Absolutely. I'm sure it's your spouse's fault. Now last week I put a note up. We're going to put this up just in a minute. Not yet. I told you faith, faith is the very substance and the key ingredient to your salvation. It's the active part of your salvation is your faith. Well, the same things for your marriage today. Go ahead and put it up. Your faith is the active part of your marriage. In other words, what you believe marriage is, is the faith you have for your marriage. And whatever you believe marriage is was developed by somebody other than just you alone. Somebody say, we're going to go there. Just like your faith was developed by who you taught you, what evidences you've seen, what, 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 what influences were in your life, what you think marriage is was also developed by someone in your life. Everybody say, uh-oh. He thinks talk about my mama. He thinks talk about my daddy. He thinks talk about my grandma. He thinks talk about my aunt. Yes, sir, I am. And I'm going to tell you right now, again, everybody say big boy breaches times. If your mom, your, let, me just, let me just tell you who raised you. Are you, are you all okay? Somebody developed what you, men, I'm going to talk to the men first. Every man in here, even young men right here, somebody is developing or has developed you to a point where you think you know what a husband is. What a husband does, how a husband acts, how he should be and do. Ladies, Married or single in here, somebody has developed you to the point and keeps on developing you of what you think a wife is. What a wife should do, what a wife's role is, and how they should act and do. Somebody's developed some influences in your life. Now, these influences can include, but not limited to, the following. It can be mom and dad. But in today's society, a lot of people don't grow up with a mom and dad both in the home. Very few do, as a matter of fact, anymore. And if you are, you're one of the weird kids. Just saying. That's what it's come to. But so, so it may be a single parent. It may be a mom. It may be a dad. It may be neither mom or dad. It may be a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle raising you. Somebody somewhere raised you. Now, in, in households where there's more than one kid, you can often look to a sibling, a brother or a sister to pattern your marriage after that. And sometimes it's even the younger ones that the older ones may pattern after if they're all old enough and married. Been there, seen that. So it could be a sibling 
could be parents, guardians, siblings. Here's a big one, believe it or not, an educator. A teacher in school, elementary school, junior high, high school, and especially when you get to college, is going to try to develop what they tell you a marriage is and what a husband is and what a wife is. And you're already been, you've been influenced by all of these so far, if you're breathing here today. And you've also been influenced in today's society by the internet and social media. Oh, check us out. We're just a cool couple. We're at the waterfall. Oh, we're on the park. We're, hey, we're going here. We're going here. Oh, with the man of my life, with the woman of my dreams, nobody I'd rather, yada, 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 yada. Two weeks later, they're divorced. <laughs> they announced, oh, we're going to divorce. And what you thought was the perfect marriage behind the scenes, they're shredding each other to pieces. So everything is not as it appears all the time. And don't let that develop what you think marriage is, just pictures. Have a better amen there. And then, of course, we don't just have social media. We have media in general. We have television movies. Please, ladies. Hallmark is not real. Come on, brother. Come on, man. Can I get a witness? Hallmark ain't real. And you know it's not real because every one of them said it's the same plot. Two people unknowingly kind of meet. They smile at each other. I know. I can tell you right then, they're going to be together at the end of the movie. <laughs> they're going to kind of dance around it a little bit, act like nothing, and then kind of have a little bit of feeling. And then once they reveal their feelings, something's going to happen where it looks like they're not going to get together. And then at the end, oh my goodness, they come together every time. Oh, <laughs> oh my heart melts. I need, I'm trying to get online to see how, how I can become a writer because I can just write what they wrote and get it to them and then just change the names. Same plot, all 973 movies. And we get this image of, oh, that's how it should be. And then when he or she don't live up to your image and to your expectations, now you got problems in your paradise. But that paradise is fake. Something has developed your mentality toward marriage and what a husband is and what a wife is. And it can be mom and dad, love mom and dad, love auntie, love grandma, papa, whatever, love, love brothers, love sisters, love, love my teachers, love, I don't love the internet a whole lot, but anyway, parts of it's okay. I don't love all the movies that are out there, but some of them are okay. And yes, I've seen most of the Hallmark movies because <laughs> I'm a husband. Come on, brothers. All right, confession, man. How many's watched them dead gum things? Come on, man. Raise your hand. Look at all the real husbands up in here. Real men. Not ashamed of the Hallmark movies. For it is the power unto us to keep our marriage good. Scripture somewhere in there, something like that. Oh, glory. Help us, Jesus. But listen. Mom and dad may not give you a good example. Grandma may not have, grandpa may not give you the best example. Teachers may not give you the best example. Instructors, college professors may not have the heart of God. And any time it doesn't line up with the word of God, you need to go with the word of God. Amen. Let me just say it like this. Go ahead and put the next note up. There's absolutely, everybody say absolutely. Zero, zero reasons or excuses for two real Christians to have a marriage that struggles in any department of life. No excuse. Well, but she, but, but, but. well, are you a child of God? Yes. Is she a child of God? Yes. What's the problem? Because when you do marriage 100% the way God said so, 100% success. Somebody's out of the will of God. Somebody's out of the will of God in marriage. Now, that doesn't mean you may not be out here doing horrible things, but if you're not doing the things of the Bible, then yeah, it's not going to produce your marriage to what God says will bless it. Amen. Be fruitful and multiply. Well, zero reasons or excuses. Zero. Turn your name and say zero. 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 But you see, there's an enemy that wants your marriage. There's an enemy that wants your finances in marriage. There's an enemy that wants your 
your entertainment in marriage. There's an enemy that wants your intimacy in marriage. Because if he knows he can get in these four or five different areas that God blessed in marriage, and if he can get you selfish, the number one reason of marriage problems isn't behavior, it's selfishness. Because bad behavior comes out of selfishness. But boy, we don't like to hear that. We like to hear what's wrong with him. We like to hear what's wrong with her. Don't tell me I'm selfish. I'm telling you today, you're selfish. You're just selfish. That's all there is to it. And you're not, you're not biblically correct. Because selfishness always produces unbiblical behavior. But somebody taught you that. Don't you talk about my mama, my daddy, my granny, my mom. I'm going to talk to you about what the Bible says. And if it hits them, it hits them. Because I've seen too many marriages follow the same pattern. Generational curses come downhill, y'all. And they may have went to church. That doesn't matter. Now, it's good. But if they don't want to be biblical, well, I'll get there in a minute. Now, oftentimes when people come to my office for marriage problems, they only come once or two times and they're done. I'm either that good or I'm too blunt and they don't like it no more. I think it's probably the latter. <laughs> because sometimes I ask them, I say, well, let me ask you, what are you doing to work on your marriage? Huh? I mean, uh, what do you do to work on your marriage? Well, I go to work. <laughs> well, that's, that's pretty good, but that's also so you can eat and live. What are you doing for your marriage? Well, uh... I mean, I mean, I don't know. So you don't know what you're doing to work on your marriage, and your marriage is not working, so <laughs> what do you think you're going to get? <laughs> I mean, seriously, what do you think is going to happen? Do you not, do you, well, I just thought we'd get married and <laughs> live on love. <laughs> How's that working for you? It's not. You're in my office. <laughs> and you're probably here, not as a result, completely 100% of your own fault, you're probably here because you listen to somebody say something about what you think, and now when that person doesn't live up to your expectations, now you're mad at him or her. Amen. So really the fault doesn't lay 100% with you, but once you reach an adulthood, you're 100% responsible for your reactions. So quit blaming mom and dad, quit blaming grandma and grandpa, quit blaming brother, sister, auntie, uncle, educator, social media. You're an adult, you said I do, you get it fixed. Well, then I ask them this right here, and I tell them to go home, and I make them do this apart from each other. I don't want you to look at each other. Don't cheat. Don't do nothing. I hand them two pieces of paper. And number one, I say, I want you to bring this back to the next session. Number one, what is the biblical mandate and role of a husband? Number two, what is the biblical mandate and role of a wife? Huh? Do you have any idea right now? Well, I mean, uh, provide a house. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. What, okay, what about spiritual matters? What about, what about intimacy? What about finances? What about all the different pillars of this holding the marriage up that God has ordained in his word, which we're not going to cover all those today because I'll get to that later. But well, I'm thinking, okay, now wait a minute. You got married to become a husband. You got married to become his wife. And you don't even know what it is. Come on. You really don't even have a biblical understanding of what a husband or a wife really is. All you know is what you've seen. That's why you should always check out before you marry somebody what they've been seeing. It's quiet in here. What's the role? What's, what's the role of a husband? What's the role of a wife? And I said, go home. Bring me back, and I want scriptures. And I want your interpretation of it. And then I'll let you know if you're right. And man, the eye-opening that happens in that. And a lot of times that's all it takes to heal a marriage when both of them are willing to participate. It's really all it takes. Why? Because it's getting back to doing it the way God says so. Because now you know. Let me ask you this. By the raising of hands, and don't be embarrassed because I will raise my hand and say I had no clue what a husband biblically was and my wife didn't have a clue what a biblical wife was when we got married. The only marriage counseling we got was, hey, you're going to have a wedding. Okay, we want to do this, this, this. Hey, guys, listen. Marriage is tough. Keep God in the center and it'll be good. Cool. 
Sounds great. Now, it's not my pastor's fault. It's not mom and dad's fault. I was an adult. I should have been studying the word to show myself to prove unto God a workman that need not be ashamed myself, as the Bible says. But I didn't take the time to read what a biblical marriage was, what a role of a husband really is, what the role of a wife really is. Had no clue. I just thought we'd get married. (laughs) Live on love. (laughs) Come on. Amen? (laughs) Boy, was we in for a surprise, wasn't we? We realized we we did some things that got on each other's nerves. I know y'all are shocked about me. Well, now, now you may not understand the biblical role, but everybody in here right now, you've already got a preconceived idea that's been developed in you by external factors where you think you know what a husband is and you think you know what a wife is according to God. And you do. I mean, really, we do. Everybody in here has got an opinion that's been developed by external circumstances. Everybody in here, self-included. But now here's some questions we need to follow that up with. Everybody say, who? Who did you see or who had your ear of development in life that developed your image of a marriage? Because you may have looked to your parents or you may have looked to a sibling or you may have looked to a teacher or you may have looked to this person or that person and, oh, and you see the surface in that, but you didn't see behind the doors or maybe some of the behind the door stuff come out and you're like, oh... That's why she's cussing at him. I understand that. That's why he just, he treating her like a dog. I don't blame him. Come on. And then that becomes who you want to be. Just because that's all you've seen and all you know. We emulate what we see and what we know. Come on. Here, God, this is a hard message to preach with you guys today. So it's, what's the role of a husband? And then who did you see the, your husband and wife model to give you a marriage of model? Because that's who you're going to bring into your marriage. And then the biggest question is, did or does what you see and what you grew up in and what you've developed your mind and your attitude toward marriage and toward a wife and a husband, does it line up 100% with the Word of God? (laughs) If it does and you were that lucky, then you've still got more to learn. Because marriages don't stand still. And you're not perfect. Neither am I. Careful. (laughs) And I'm still, we're still learning. We're still in development because we're still on earth and we're still married. Are you with me? But if what you've seen and what developed you and what gave you a mindset and what makes you tick or ticked off was not 100% in line with the Word of God, then you've got some redeveloping to do in your life toward marriage and a husband and a wife. And I don't care how old you are. It knows no age difference. Just because you've been married over 20 years doesn't guarantee you 21 years. Unless you work at it. Unless you develop into the man and the woman of God God called you to be for this year. Whew. I have a saying, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. I've got another one now developed. Go ahead and put it up. Show me who developed your idea of what marriage is, and I'll show you your future. I'll show you your future. If you grew up most... Now, let me tell you something. There are the rare times, and I'm going to go over this. There are the times when you see a person grow up in an abusive home, a horrible example of mom and dad fighting, fussing, divorcing, affairs here, affairs, slings here. Mom's out with another guy, dad's out with another woman or whatever. They, you, drinking, boozing, drugging, all that. You come up in that. And some people follow a lot along with that. That's the norm. But there are people who break out. Yeah. Hallelujah. And the reason they break out is that I'm never going to do that. That's not what I'm called to be. When I find me a wife, I'm going to know how to treat her. When I find me a husband, I'm going to know how to treat my husband. I'm not going to have this generational curse follow me. And it's broken just like that. It's not a problem. Everybody say, it's not a problem. problem. Now, you show me who developed your idea of what marriage is, and I'll show you your future, unless you get saved and biblically understanding and developed with your knowledge of what marriage is by God. And that's what we call breaking the curse. Well, I was raised up in this. It's just the way I am. No, it's not just the way you are according to the Word of God. When you get saved, you get redeemed. In other words, I'm redeemed out of the mindset of what marriage is. It's not really biblical. And I'm redeemed to God's word about what marriage is and what a husband really is, what a wife really is. 
in every form and fashion. Say amen. amen. Now, how many know that Satan wants to come and deceive you about that, though? He wants you to stay in whatever you've learned, especially if what you learned doesn't line up 100% with God. Amen. Now, you may have seen 80% in your home, but there's still 20% that you're going to bring into your marriage that's not biblical. Well, let me put up the next note. Even when you're deceived about marriage, you're still deceived. Boy, that does just fell over like a ton of bricks. When you're deceived about marriage and you've been developed in wrong things and wrong thinking and wrong ideologies and wrong thoughts about marriage and you've brought that in, if you're deceived about marriage, listen to me, you're, I was deceived. We were, I mean, I think, speak for her, we were both deceived of what we thought it was going to be. And thank God we worked through it and we continue to work at it because when you, the day you don't want to work at it is the day it's already failing. Well, now, when you're deceived about marriage, you're still deceived. Now, that's bad enough. But in marriage, what's horrible is it don't just affect you, it affects your spouse now. It affects that woman you stood up and took your vows to. It affects that man you stood up and took vows to God to. Whew. You're not alone in marriage. You may feel alone, but you're not. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Some translations say good behaviors. Don't be deceived. If you stay in anything that's not God-based marriage, God-based husband, God-based wife, you're deceived. Now again, I'm not meaning this to be mean today because I, I, I wished I would have had this message back in our first and second years, first five years of marriage. It wasn't until we came into the five love language teaching that was released that I, even, I, I never even looked at marriage beyond just, <laughs> we're married. <laughs> Let's just see what happens. No, I didn't know God had a plan and a purpose and a role for me as a husband. And a, I mean, I had a little bit, of, but boy, wow. And the more I've studied, the more I've still blown away. God's awesome with marriage. Amen? Amen? Now, let me go ahead and put it up. You may not like it, but it's okay. Go ahead and put up the next note. Any belief about marriage other than God's way is evil. Any belief system you've learned from mom or dad or auntie or uncle, brother, sister, aunt, Whatever, a teacher, sibling, off the internet, off the TV shows. If it is not of God, then it is of the enemy. It's evil. Yeah, yeah it. It wasn't maybe intended to be evil. Maybe it's just been evil that's been passed down generation to generation. But somewhere, the curse has got to be broken. And why not let it be you in your marriage? Instead of a marriage strife and, and this and fuss and gripe and yeah and yeah and yeah, how about I start a, a generational blessing of marriage? That your kids look up and say, man, if I could just have a marriage like mom and dad. Most kids can never say that. But they learn it, and then they bring it right into their marriage. Good preaching, amen, I'll help you. So any behavior outside the Word of God is what? Everybody say evil. You see, God set it up in the original commission for Christian marriage to be the example of the world and dominate the world. When the world wants to know, what, does mar what is marriage? Oh, well, they're so-and-so. They're children of God. Look at their marriage. Look at their family. Look how they conduct themselves. Look how they love each other. That ought to be the example. You and I, our marriage, it testifies. And unfortunately, now we're in an era that marriage testifies that we ain't got a clue what God does with marriage. We're testifying more of what the enemy's plan is in the, in the church versus what God's model is. Amen. And it's because we've been developed that way. Yeah. I'm going to give you a couple more scriptures. Now, this next scripture I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you in three translations. First translation is the, new, uh, the, the, the King James, New King James. The second translation, which was really the way I like to read it, is in the New Living Translation. And the third translation is in the PJV version. 
Pastor Joey version. <laughs> Same scripture, three, three interpretations. Okay, I'm writing my own. Okay, but anyway. It's a scripture you're familiar with, but again, we've never looked at this scripture through marriage eyes. And it goes along with what I'm saying. Something has developed you to the point where you're at right now. Go ahead and put it up. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your, everybody say, my mind, that I can prove what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Somebody say, thank you for the word. Now let's go ahead and put it up in the NLT. The NLT says like this, don't you copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you, everybody say the way I think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So now we're, we're not dealing with your spirit. We're not dealing with the spirit of a saved person. We're dealing with the soulish realm, which is the mind. Because it is the mind that has been developed as something that's not of God. Even when you get saved, the mind can still have those thoughts and patterns. That's why he says you've got to be renewed in your mind. You've got to change the way you think because something developed a wrong thinking. Especially when it comes to marriage. Husband and wife. Mom and dad. Now, the PJV version of Romans 12, 2. Don't copy the marriage behavior and customs of the world. But let God transform you into a new person slash spouse by changing the way you think about your marriage. <laughs> then you will learn to know God's will for you and your marriage, which is good and pleasing and perfect for your spouse and you. Published today. Trademark right there, baby. We don't copy what the world says is marriage, guys. If we do, we're going to get what the world gets in our Christian home, which is constant aggravation, constant frustration, constant arguing, constant nagging and complaining, and guys can do that too. Can I get a witness, ladies? Amen. That was a little too hardy there, but anyway. We get what the world gets in marriage when we do marriage the way the world says. But we will continue to do marriage the way the world says, even as Christians, until we redevelop the way we think according to the Word of God about a Bible-believing husband and wife. And get the external factors away, sometimes you may have to separate a little bit from mom and dad for a while. That's why it says, cleave to your husband. In other words, break the influence, the bad influence, if it came from mom and dad, brother, sister, teacher, whatever. Amen. And when you're in school, you may not can break away from them so hard. Yeah. But you know, going in there, I'm not going to let this influence what I know the Bible says. I'm going to get through this class. I'm going to stand on the ground. If he asks me, or my teacher asks me what marriage is, I'm going to tell him it's between a man and a woman, and that's it. If he flunks me out of the class, I done told my daughter's fixing to go to college. I said, baby, you flunk out of class for standing on the Bible, I will parade you all the way home and applaud you. But don't you dare surrender who you are, what you are to some instructor over there that's perverted. I got you back. Because the F on his paper is an A plus in the kingdom of God. Well. Y'all Okay. So somebody influenced you. Could have 80, 95% good, but even if there's 5% negativity, get it out of your marriage, you don't have room for 5% because 5% turns to 10. 10 turns to 20 later on. 20 turns to 30. And then before you know it, now let me tell you something. Let me ask you this. Let, let me ask you this. There's something else I ask couples sometimes. When you got married, all the married people wave at me. Right, let me ask y'all, who did you take your vow to? Who did you take your vow to? And? God and your spouse. Good answer. Correct answer. Do you know the way that most marriages work? They took their vow to their self. They took a vow to their self. 
I don't care what he or she wants or needs. I'm going to take care of me first. I'm going to, for better, for richer, for poorer, for, for me. Not for them, for me. See, when you get married, you are giving yourself to the other person. And if you don't trust the other person, then don't get married. For God's sake, don't do it. Well, what if I think I've already done it? Well, you there, make it work. The answer is not leaving and making another mistake. Well, well, what happens if you've already left and made the other mistake? You make work work where you're at. You start right now saying, I'm going to find out what a biblical husband is, what a biblical wife is, what a biblical marriage, how to honor God in all the different pillars that hold up a marriage, finances. That's a big one. Entertainment, what you enjoy doing together. Intimacy. All of these needs are not what I need, it's what does my spouse need. That's the vow to them and God. And I will forsake all others, giving myself only unto you, so long as we both shall live. Baloney. <laughs> Kept that one in bounds, didn't I? And you said it. And you said it to God. Now let me tell you something. God took it serious. And your spouse probably took it serious. But if you didn't, that's on you. But now again, you are affecting your marriage. Now here's the thing about it. Everybody, every single person in here is going to give an account to God. And do you know you're going to give an account to God for your marriage? I'm about to stand before God one day and say, how did you treat my, my princess? That queen I gave you of my kingdom. And she's going to, have to stand up there and he's going to say, how did you treat my prince son? That kingdom man I gave you. And then together we're going to have to give an account for our marriage and how we raised our kids. And I don't want him looking at me and going, you want to know why your kids are in this shape? Because your marriage was in this shape. You not only hurt each other, you hurt this generation. Whew. Now listen, it's not about bringing condemnation to anybody today. But it's about learning to redevelop what you know is marriage and family based on the word of God. And you pick up where you're at right now and you say, today's a new day. Today's a new day. And my marriage and my family are going to be blessed because we're going to draw the blessings out of heaven. All right, come on, get me up out of here. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. <laughs> now, I'm going to be honest with you. I use this at a lot of funerals. I do. Yeah, I use this at a lot of funerals. I think it's a wonderful verse for a funeral, but it also, marriage, marri it also mirrors marriage. Somebody asked me a long time ago, and I've been asked everything, hey, you know, your license to, to marry the living and bury the dead, which one do you like doing better? I say, I like to be doing funerals better. They're like, do what? I'm like, if the person is saved, a funeral is a much more joyful occasion most of the time, especially if they're elderly. I can't believe you said that. Absolutely. If they're saved, I know where they're at, and I know they're eternally happy. In marriage, mm, who knows? <laughs> who knows what's fixing to happen? It may be the most miserable time of his life. It may be the most miserable time of her life. It may be both of them in just total misery the rest of their life. I don't know. That's why I will not marry anyone without almost 50-something hours of counseling now. Oh, yeah, I've upped my game. Why? Because I know more now. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, brethren. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. I want to put it up in the Passion Translation now. Same verse, 4, 8 of Philippians, Passion Translations. So keep your thoughts continually, everybody say continually, continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind. Watch this now. And fasten your thoughts. Everybody say, my thoughts. On every glorious work of God, praising Him always. Yeah. Woo! Why is that verse being read today? Because out of being developed, maybe in even 1% wrong about viewing a husband and a wife or their role or whatever and not knowing and 
being developed in the wrong way maybe in, in just any aspect of area of life, of marriage. When something goes wrong, that's what you revert to. And you revert out of your mouth. And then you'll gather around other people that are reverting out of their mouth the same problem. Now listen to me, ladies. There are other women who are married who hate their husbands. And you get around them. And you get around them. And they begin to talk about it, complain about their husbands. and yeah, yeah. It, can, it can be mom and dad. It can be brother or sister. It can be whoever's marriage is not what biblically is and you're around them. They have influence to develop you even right now where you're at as a child of God. And if they're a man hater and a husband hater, love them from a distance. Because you can't afford for your mind to constantly be thinking about all this negative with him. And men, same thing with your wife. If your brother's marriage or your sister's marriage ain't like that, or your mom and dad's or your teacher or whoever's influencing you right now about what marriage, and they're just a bunch of women haters, you love them from a distance. But you better distance yourself from that kind of influence. Because don't be deceived. You remember that scripture in 1 Corinthians? Don't be deceived. When you get around people, it's going to affect you. And you can't afford to have bad thoughts about your spouse. So in other words, keep your thoughts towards your spouse continually fixed on all that is authentic and real. Think things about your spouse that are honorable and admirable. When it comes to your spouse, think about the beauty and the respectful things in them. Think about the things that are pure and holy in him and her. And then for you, offer that mercy and that kindness to your spouse that you offer to everybody else. And fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God in your marriage, praising Him always. That's another PJV verse. Now, this is not going to be on your screen, but I want to give you the results of when you do this because the next verse says this, not on your screen, because I want you to listen. Follow the example of all that we have imparted to you and the God of peace will be with you in all things. The God of peace will be with you in your marriage. The God of peace will be in with you, wife, when your husband's being a jerk. Guys, the peace of God will be with you when your wife's being a nag. But it won't last because it has no room in your marriage unless you give it room. Put up the last note for today. There it is. It's coming. It's a good one, too. Where your mind goes your marriage will follow. Come on, I want you to declare that with me. Say, where my mind goes, my marriage will follow. That's a true statement, folks. If you're thinking horrible about marriage, if you think it's... Then that's what it's going to be. But if you're thinking, man, I can't wait to get home. See, there's two kinds of I get home for husbands and wife. I can't wait to get home or oh no, another battle. Don't be your spouse's next battle when they get home. Good preaching, amen. What you think about your spouse matters. But do you know how you think about your spouse? By what's been developed in your whole life toward what you think marriage is. That's why it's important to redevelop on the Word of God. Let's stand our feet. You made it through. I don't see no blood yet. Can I tell you this right here? Number one, listen to me. Love God. Everybody say, love God. love God. If you're married, love your spouse. Love your spouse. And love yourself in Christ Jesus. If you can love yourself, love God, and love your spouse, then you got a 100% chance of your marriage being what very few people's are, and that's tremendously blessed by the Lord. And the last piece of advice, get around other mature people married Christian couples hang out in life groups where marriages are solid because as good as bad influence can rub off on you so can good and the Bible says seek wise counsel so we always look to our elders and their marriages here at the church even and our elders have a, a beautiful role model of marriage in our church and we can see marriage from them and we can apply it look at why well, ain't you been married 30 something years yeah but they've been married now how long y'all been married 57. 57 Chevy, baby, with the fins and all. Boom! So again, get around people that you see their marriage has stood the test of time. 
from a biblical standpoint, not an arguing standpoint. They're still hanging in there. I'm going to share one story with you real quick. I used to work with a guy. He was a welder. I'm not going to tell you his name because he's still probably in the North Alabama region. And he'd come to work, scratched up, bleeding sometimes. I'm like, my God, what happened? Oh, man, the old lady got into it again. Yeah, every time we get to drinking a good bit, that kind of happens. I've never hit her, and I've shoved her enough to get off of me, me to get away from her. She just goes wild, and I'm never, never, Man, y'all need to get right. <laughs> One day he come in. Look here, his right eye was swelled shut, completely shut on this side. Big old knot right there on the bottom of that eye socket. I said, my God, I like to call his name. I said, dude, what happened? I thought, you know, something major, and something major did happen. He said, well, we got to hitting the bottle again this weekend. Got into it. I said, son, she can hit. He said, no. He said, we got into it so much, she come around, went to the bedroom, got the 357. Come out with my 357 Magnum, leveled it off and began to squeeze some rounds off at me, and I dove behind the couch and caught the cough corner of the, the table on the couch. Typical marriage in America. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Bill, hide them new guns you got, brother. Don't give her, I just give her some ideas, brother. Hide them two new guns. But let me tell you something about the glory of the Lord. Now, this was back in what, when I was at Electro Design in the 80s. This was in the late 80s when I was working at a plant. I saw this man probably about five or six, seven years ago at Walmart. And I'm shocked he's still alive. And his wife was with him. And I was scared. <laughs> so, dear God, I said, hey, hey, how y'all doing? Man, we're good. Heard you're pastoring now. I said, yeah, that's a shocker, ain't it? He said, yeah, that's shocking. He said, you want to hear something even more shocking? I said, what? He said, dude, me and my wife got saved. <laughs> me and my wife are saved, and we're living for God, and we're in church serving together, and, and I ain't been shot at since. <laughs> <laughs> she just cut it over her head like that. He might have got shot at out the parking lot since he told that, but anyway. But guys, your marriage will be what you put in it. You will get the marriage that you want. You'll get the marriage you want. That you work for. But the most important thing here today, I gotta go, I know. Do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Because you can't know marriage without knowing who created it. Now, throw marriage out the window. You can't know heaven, an eternal home in heaven without Jesus. So let's bow our heads real quickly. If you're here and you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, today's your day. No strings attached. You will not join church today. You will not become religious today. You will surrender your life to the only one who died for you, rose from the grave from you, and lives for you right now. And has been waiting on you to surrender your life to Him. And you'll start today, and you'll start a whole new journey of your life learning how to be a man of God or a woman of God. And you'll learn how to be a husband of God and a wife and a parent, a grandparent. Whatever role you have now will be filtered through what the Word of God says. I've not done it perfectly, but man, my heart's desire is to continue to please my Father in heaven. So if that's you today, and you say, man, I just want to get saved today. That's what we call being saved in the church. I want to surrender my life to Christ. Just anybody, lift your hand right now. Anyone. Anybody? All right, maybe at home, whatever. All right, real quickly. I'm going to go ahead and do this now, and I don't want you to be ashamed. Lord, not disrespecting anybody in our life, but if there's things that have been poured into me that doesn't line up with your word, Lord, I want it gone. Lift your hands. I'm lifting mine. Lord, not disrespectful. I loved my parents, loved my siblings. I had, I had pretty good teachers. Most of them had some good instructors. And, but Lord, I know that there's probably been some things influenced my life that didn't line up with your word. And I want to be the, the husband and the, the dad and the granddad you want me to be, God. And I know that can only come by me surrendering to you. So Father, we just commit ourselves to become who you say we are according to the word. And Lord, we say this when we say, I renounce any bad development in my life from any person or thing and I break that curse in the name of Jesus I establish a generation marital 
blessing of a man, husband, and a woman wife, according to your word, in my life, in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, can you celebrate that today, church? Yeah.